Second Chronicles seventh chapter fourteenth verse. This is one of the most often quoted scriptures in the Word of God. And when I read it, you are going to wrap your head around it and say, I've heard that time and time again. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their lands. You know, that uh, verse of scripture starts with two letters. And that two letters spells a word called if. And I want to preach to you tonight the challenge of the word if. The challenge of the word if. God bless you, you may be seated. There's an incredible power in that word. It will make every decision in your life. There's not one thing that you'll go to do that you will not invoke the word, what if I do that? And then if you decide to go the other way, you will say, what if I don't decide to do that? And that word is so very, very powerful. And so with it, it has its own incredible power. And it's a challenge. It was meant to challenge every one of us. If you follow the word if through the dictionary, it'll bring you to a longer word. And that longer word is the word prerogative. That's a nice way of saying you're going to have to make a decision. And the prerogative lies in the fact of what you think is the best for you and what you think you ought to do. And when you say the word if, I want you to know immediately it makes you responsible. It doesn't make your neighbor responsible. It doesn't make your mom and dad responsible. It's up to you, the word if. And with it, you've got to understand something about life. With the word if, it gives you the power to process the way you were treated. It gives you the power to process what you think. It gives you the power to process what your intention are. It gives you the power to give yourself a bolstered strength that you can face a battle when you don't think you can face it because when you get with the word if, it will bring you and you'll go through a litany of things. If I do that, if I had this, if I go there, if I talk to God, if I'm in church, if I'm fasting and praying, if I'm, it's, am I making any sense? And so you understand that this word makes us responsible. It is the very center of the choice factor. And when we say choose, that's what that old prophet said. He said, choose you today who you will serve. But as for me and my house, where we're going to serve the Lord, it, it, it is that, it's that choice factor. And with that choice factor comes this awesome thing called responsibility. Now that's something that our world likes to get away from. They want everybody else to be responsible. But I want you to know something. Whatever you do to Edwin has no effect on what I feel about you. You say, Brother Harper, how in the world is that so? Somebody can make you feel bad. You might feel bad, but that doesn't control the way I feel about you. Because that's totally a decision that I've got to make. I'm the one that has to decide. Am I going to be strong? Am I going to be kind? Am I going to be gracious? Am I going to be filled with forgiveness? Because the scripture goes on and tells us things. And here's what a lot of people don't understand. Let me tell you how prevalent the word if. The word if is found in the Bible 1,545 times. When you understand that, it gives you the, the reckoning of the fact that God reached down here and He wants each one of us to be responsible for our walk with Him, with our life with Him, with our ideologies of Him. Let me tell you what, you're not very long into the Bible until you get to Genesis, the fourth chapter and the sixth verse. And the story pops up about the man by the name of Cain 
Why art thou wrought? And why is thy countenance fallen? Then he gets in. Here's where it starts. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? But if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So what you've got to wrap your head around, it's decision time. Am I going to do well or am I not going to do well? And I'm going to walk righteously or am I going to walk unrighteously? And just be sure of this, that whatever you decide to do, what you sow today, you're going to reap tomorrow. That's not very nice, Brother Harper. That's like blaming us. That's like saying it's my fault. Hello. You see, the core of everything comes back to a responsibility for you. Now, now we live in a cycle of psychology this day. And what we have done is we have raised a whole generation of folks under the, under the guise of intelligence to tell them that they need to go back in their life and they need to search out who it was that treated them how and who it was that took them down that road and what so-and-so did to make them act the way they act. That's the whole, and this Freudian thing gets to swelling up and, and going on. The Bible never dealt with that kind of situation. It always deals with the fact, I want to know what you're doing, where you are, what's going on in your life, how you feel about it. And many times, our situation in life may not be so much the way we actually act and what we do as it is the way we think. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, in his heart, so is he. And if you go through life and you want to be tormented, think you're tormented. If you go through life and you want to be, let me tell you what, there are some folks in our society today that specialize in being offended. They want a reason to act goofy. They want a reason that they don't feel like they ought to work that hard at work. They want a reason to figure out why that they shouldn't tolerate that preacher preaching to them like he does. They want a reason to understand why that they don't have to be strong and faithful. And so they have developed a culture of liking to be offended. Now one of the main things about offense is this. Most people's offense comes because they want attention. You'd be surprised how many people think that they are so special that the whole world's after them. The whole world's against me. Everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. The kids used to have a little song, everybody hates me, nobody likes me, I'm going to eat some worms. Didn't sound very appetizing to me either. But if that's what you want out of life, that's what you'll get out of life. You've heard me tell the story about the boy that the dad took to the canyon. Everywhere this boy went, he was always coming home and mealy-mouthing around to his father. This person's picking on me. The teacher's picking on me. The next-door neighbor's picking on me. Everybody's picking on me. So his dad said, well, since everybody's picking on you, I'm going to show you something that you probably never realized. He said, what's that, Dad? He said, we're going to go take a trip to the canyon. You're going to the canyon? Yes, we're going to the canyon. What are you going to do at the canyon? I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you how that that canyon hates you. And the little boy's countenance faded, said, the canyon hates me? He said, yeah. He said, watch this. Walk out there and raise your voice as loud as you can and scream I hate you. And the little boy walked out there and screamed, I hate you. And the canyon hollered back, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. His daddy looked at him, his tears welled up in his eyes. He said, I, I never do that. He said, change the canyon's opinion. He said, how am I going to change the canyon's opinion? 
I said, change the canyon's opinion, Daddy said, by saying, I love you. And the little boy reared back and screamed, I love you. And the canyon chanted back, I love you, I love you, I love you. I want you to know something. What you sow is what comes home to you. Everybody with me now? And it comes back to a matter where he looked at Cain. He said, Cain, if you do well, <laughs> you're going to be accepted. But if you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. There's a terrible power in this word, if. And the word, if, with all that it has to offer us, brings us down the road to tell you this. It even gets down to our redemption. How many in here want to be saved? You want to hear it? If any man or woman will take up their cross and follow me, how are we doing now? I want you to know something. It, it, it even affects the way that you give to the work of God. I know people want blessings, but the Bible says that prove the Lord, given to him a sacrifice and an offering, and see if he will not open the windows of heaven and pour out upon you a blessing that you can't contain. Such a power in that word if. That word if. You see, you're going <laughs> to... A long time ago I found out I wasn't perfect. As long as I wasn't looking in the mirror, I thought I was perfect. But when I looked in the mirror, I found out one ear was bigger than the other. One side of my nose had a bigger hole in it than the other did. One ear was longer than the other one. I found out I wasn't perfect. So one old fellow said that he avoided mirrors because he hated to see a grown man cry. I don't know about all that, but I will tell you this. When you realize that you're not perfect, when you realize that you are not perfect, you also realize this, that you have the capacity, as righteous as you may attempt to be, and as good as you might attempt to be, we've got this problem we're dealing with, and that is we got this stuff called flesh. Oh, and the flesh has got a whole catalog. And in that catalog of the flesh, it's actually labeled as the works of the flesh. It's capable of anything, absolutely capable of anything. And the only thing that you can do is fight back with all you've got to fight back with. But, 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 the Bible says if, if you sin, woo, I've got an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, that's able to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Are we doing all right? The power of this word, if. You know, and when we see it coming to us like that, I'll tell you what, you're sitting in here tonight, and I know that there's people sitting here want healed. They want healed. I got a wife I want healed. We've got things, but, but let me tell you where it is. The Bible said, everybody said, the Bible said, if you have faith as of a grain of mustard seed. Now, let's stop right there. That has nothing to do with the size. You hear people say, oh, it just takes a little bit of faith. I don't care what's a little bit or a whole lot. The kind of faith you had decides on the results of it. Faith as a grain of mustard seed. Faith is the one herb seed that you can plant in the earth. I'm a country boy. We always made sure we had plenty of room between the cantaloupes and the watermelons. Made sure we had plenty of room between the cucumbers and the pumpkins. I'm going to tell you why. It does this little thing called cross-pollinate. And the Bible said that if you sow diver seeds together, that it will defile the product. In other words, it'll make it taste terrible when you go to eat it. Because cross-pollination 
does that. But here's something that's neat about mustard seed. You can plant mustard seed beside anything and it never comes up tasting like cantaloupe. It always comes up mustard. Plant it beside the cucumbers or the corn. Or as my poppy Kirk used to say, the maters. Or you can put it down there with the taters. They used to say, don't plant potatoes and onions together. He said, because the onions will come up and make the eyes of the taters water. But it doesn't matter where you plant that mustard. It's going to come up mustard. Come here, cancer. I don't like you. I'm telling God that I want you to be gone. And I believe that God's going to heal and deliver. So here's what I'm going to do, cancer. I'm going to plant faith like a grain of mustard seed beside you. And when this faith comes up, it's not going to come up cancer. It's going to come up faith. I said it's going to come up faith. Come here, trouble of life. I'm going to plant faith beside you. And it's coming up. And it's going to be whole. Because if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say, mountain, be thou removed. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, We're having a pretty good church. Yeah. But if a grain of wheat fall in the ground and die, it'll bring forth abundantly. Make your commitment to God. Four types of ground. There's the hard ground. There's the shallow ground, stony. There's the thorny ground, but there's the good ground. Go ahead and plant it. Go ahead and plant it. Go ahead and plant it. Now, I got a question for you tonight. What are you going to do with your if? If my people, y'all still with me? I just felt a surge of the Holy Ghost go through this building. Yes. If my people, which are called by my name, somebody tell me his name, shall humble themselves. Ha! And if they'll pray, and if they'll seek my face, and if they'll turn from their wicked ways, then I'm going to hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. But it's based on if. You see, when you're dealing with God, God is so gracious and good, but but he always asks something out of you. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When you have said that in the Lord's Prayer, you have said the secret to every measure of life. Because what you do on earth directly affects what God responds to you from heaven. Are we all right? And when you understand that, that's the reason why you give. And he said, it'll be given unto you. You sow here, but you reap from up there. How we doing? When you see what it does, everybody say if. I'm, I'm going to live on the right side of if. How about you? I'd like to get on the right. I'd like to say to, to Cain, Cain, I want to do what's good because I, I want to prosper. But it all comes down to a decision. Well, you know, you don't have to pay your tithes. We don't walk around with a gun and tell you that you got to have your tithes and pay it. But if you want the blessings of God, you'll pay your tithes. I talked to a friend of mine the other day, and I was telling him, I said, your church is having a tough time. I said, because they don't give and take care of their preacher. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Because that this church has blessed the work of God and been faithful over the years. Do you know why we're sitting in an auditorium like this? 
Do you know why that we've seen revival and people come through and get the Holy Ghost? Do you know why that we've got things that's touching every aspect of this community? It's because of you. And if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll give beyond your ability. And if you'll give, he opens the windows of heaven and pours. Is that what he does? If my people that are called by my name, what's his name? If they'll humble themselves. I want you to know and pray. The Bible says that God hates a proud look. He only responds to the humble. <laughs> you see, I've met some people who claim they're going to give God orders. If you want to make God laugh, make a plan. That's the way it always works out. And so, I'm coming to a close, musicians. What are you going to do about if? If, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be saved, I want you to repent of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of your sins. I want you to be obedient to the word of God. Repent and be baptized. One of the most inclusive scriptures in the whole Bible is in Acts 2 and 38. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All of that was based on a question that was made. What shall we do? And that's what it came back to. This is what you shall do. I want you to let God fill you with the Holy Ghost. I want you to be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do mean baptized. I don't mean sprinkled. I don't mean pour water on them. I mean baptize them. Yeah. They tell the story of the old farmer that had a dead horse. And he called up his particular preacher, this particular denomination. He said, I want you to come out and help me bury my horse. The preacher come out, had a bucket full of dirt, and he walked by and he sprinkled that dirt on top of that dead horse. He said, he's buried. He said, buried, yeah. He said, he's buried. Remember the scripture says, buried with Christ and baptized. I just baptized him with sprinkling dirt on him. He's buried. An amazing thing. In four weeks, that old horse stunk. And there's a lot of people who sin stink because they don't manage to be buried with Christ. Immersed, put under water, the Bible way. Yes. Well, let's stand together. Oh, I preached to you. But you know what I know was going on while I was preaching? Some of you were preaching to yourself. Is that right? Some of you were preaching to yourself. You were going through the if catalog of your life. Just dig in and do it. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want to be saved. I want to do what I got to do. I want to look the way he wants me to look. I want to talk the way he wants me to talk. Act the way he wants me to act. Move forward in life like he wants me to. Come on, let's all come to the altar and pray. You can use anything, Lord, you can use.